Welcome to Wake Up TV. We have several topics lined up for you today. Following an arson fire that shut down Leesville Community Library earlier this year, the library is set to reopen soon. We'll have details. Plus, we'll show you how users of the county's recreational waterways are being informed about the health of the waters they use. All that's ahead on Wake Up TV. The Wake County Public Health Department's Communicable Disease Division is tasked with developing policy and procedures designed to address best practices in dealing with outbreaks of various types of infectious diseases in the Wake County community. Joining us to talk about this important issue is Sue Lynn Ledford, the Public Health Director, and Alexis Wyatt, social worker with the county's Communicable Disease Program. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having us. What are considered communicable diseases and what impact can they have on our communities? Communicable diseases are primarily caused by agents that are viruses, bacteria, other things that are in the environment and can cause serious health conditions. We monitor in Wake County, along with all other public health departments across the state, over 70 mandatory reportable diseases. That includes an array of diseases. There are a lot of things that we cover. We cover everything from uh, measles and mumps and pertussis to Ebola potential, uh, MERS, and even like our uh, communicable STDs, sexually transmitted diseases. Now, how are these diseases reported to county staff? Okay. We have this state has a very good mechanism for us to report. Uh, we have a system where we do surveillance and law requires, actually, general statute requires that all private providers that diagnose or are uh, suspicious that there is a case of any of these 70 plus diseases, that they report that to us at the Public Health Division. So what we do with that is we incorporate that into our surveillance. We then uh, have an electronic disease surveillance system that that information is put into, sent to the state, and the state then compiles for the CDC, Center for Disease Control. What are some of the factors that would require staff to implement more aggressive responses to a particular outbreak? So really that depends upon what the disease is. Uh, for some diseases, you know, we see several hundred cases a year, sometimes thousands of cases. So that's where the baseline surveillance comes in. We know what the norm is for that. And if it starts bumping above that norm, then we start paying particular attention and do real-time surveillance. But there are some diseases that one case would be significant. And some of the ones I mentioned earlier, Ebola, obviously, MERS, any of those types of measles would be significant. And so we would immediately respond to those types of uh, communicable diseases. One of the recent uh, concerns that we have related to an increase in disease, communicable disease is syphilis. And syphilis is right now, we have the highest number of cases in over 20 years. It's a significant increase. Um, part of our team that helps us to work, we have a whole array of specialists, our communicable disease nurses and our disease intervention specialists are especially important to us in, in relationship to the syphilis outbreak. Alexis, what are some of the factors that's caused an uptick in the number of reported syphilis cases in this county? Multiple factors influence the increase in syphilis um, cases. Some of those factors are biological. Oftentimes, signs and symptoms of STDs go unnoticed, especially in women. Um, and syphilis, especially in its primary and most infectious stages, um, the, the sign and symptom, initial sign and symptom, is painless and it goes away without treatment. And so oftentimes people don't know that they need to seek medical care. Uh, what's being done to address this public health issue and what should citizens do if they suspect that they or someone they know may be infected? 
Wake County is taking a multi-pronged approach currently to addressing this public health issue. We have increased syphilis screening in multiple locations, the Wake County Public Health Clinics, the regional centers in Zebulon, Wake Forest, and Fuquay Verena will be increasing their testing and diagnosing capabilities. And Sulin can talk about kind of more of the broad approach as to how we're, we're addressing this issue here in Wake County. Thank you, Alexis. As Alexis mentioned, this is a multi-pronged approach because there are so many factors that contribute to this outbreak. So we're attempting to make sure that all of our providers are fully informed. They know to be uh, monitoring for this. We have a provider alert that we have on our web page. Anyone that is interested can sign up for that. We also have mechanisms that we have uh, set up in place in each of the regional centers, as Alexis alluded to. We're doing training for our staff. We're doing training for the community. We're doing increased testing in the community. And we're doing things such as this today, where we are trying to make sure the media and other information portals have needed information to make people more aware. It's easy to think that you might have something else. Syphilis is called the great imitator. So many of the symptoms can mimic other diseases. So, for example, if someone has a rash on their hand, their feet, it might, they might go to a dermatologist for that. But when you, when you understand that some of the classic symptoms of syphilis would be similar to that, we, we need to make people aware that those are classic symptoms. We also know that anytime someone has ulcers or sores, um, that's, that's a big issue also. And those are kinds of symptoms that people might not register as being syphilis. They may not know that they came in contact. So we're trying to make sure this approach is very uh, expansive and we're working with multiple partners in our community. It's not just Wake County. There are a lot of people that are working with us on this. And final question, how can citizens find out more information uh, about what was discussed today? Well, there, of course, is a link on our wakegov.com, so we encourage people, they can go to the Human Services Department there, and Public Health has a link, so they're, they're welcome to uh, go there to find information. If they have specific concerns that are particular to them, and they feel like they're not sure what to do, they can call our 919-212-7000 that call center can link people to the appropriate communicable disease team and we will make sure that they are linked with um, for testing and potentially treatment if they need it. Okay. Sue Lynn Ledford, Wake County Public Health Director, Alexis Wyatt, Social Worker with the Communicable Disease Division with Wake County, thank you so much for being here. Thank, thank you. you. How can I help my daughter with her reading? Searching for help with Dachshund Reading. Why do you not get me? I do. This is what it feels like for kids with learning and attention issues. Redirecting to understood.org. As you know, Wake County offers a variety of places to go and enjoy the outdoors, but it's also the time of year that you need to pay special attention to some insects that could pose health hazards such as ticks. Carla P. Drahita, health educator with the Communicable Disease Program with Wake County Human Services is here to talk about ticks and how to prevent those pesky insects. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, first, I guess the most important thing, how do you check for ticks? Yeah, so that is really important. The, the, the most important thing, if you learn nothing else today, is that you should be doing a tick check every time after you spend time outside. So the best way to do that is, of course, to get naked so you can see yourself and then get in, hop in the shower. And then you want to um, feel all over with your fingers and make sure that you're checking all the places ticks like to hang out. So they, they tend to like to go to warm, moist places. And so they might be up in your scalp, in your hair, uh, behind your ears or in your ears, um, behind your neck and under your arms. You wanna make sure you check around your waist and in your belly button. 
uh, in the groin area between your legs and behind your knees. Of course, a tick can be anywhere, and not just in those places, but some of them are hiding in those places and you might not find them as easily. And then when you get out, you want to look in the mirror and just check anything that felt unusual when you were in the shower and um, see if you can, you know, check and make sure if that's a tick or not. And you want to make sure that you're checking your kids um, at the end of the day also, and also your pets that you've had outside with you. Uh, how can people prevent tick-borne illnesses? So the most important thing that you can do is take an attached tick off right away. Okay, that's really important. Just get that thing off of you as soon as possible. If a tick is attached for less than 24 hours, there's not as good a chance that they'll be able to spread the diseases they carry to you. And so you want to get that tick off. The other thing that you can do, of course, is when you're going to be outside, um, wear tick repellents. So there are certain repellents that you can put on your skin, and then there are other repellents that you can use on your clothes, on your shoes, and on your gear that you might have, like if you're going camping or something like that. So you want to use that other type of repellent. Then, of course, there are special repellents for your pets as well. So those work really well. You should ask your vet what would be the best repellent for them. You want to make sure that you um, stay on paths if you're walking in the woods. Tick habitats are like woody area, brushy areas, places with long grasses, um, leaf litter. They like all those types of places. Again, warm, moist places. So, um, so they could be hiding out in any of those places. So if you stay on paths or uh, mowed lawns and things like that, you'll be less likely to get a tick on you. Of course, wearing long pants tucked into your socks and wearing shoes that don't have, uh, that aren't open toed is probably a good idea too to keep them off you because most ticks do get on you from the bottom and, and climb up. Uh, there are so many ways that people say you can get a tick off, scratch it, burn it, what have you, put alcohol on it, but what is the best way to remove an attached tick? Yeah, we don't really want to do any of those things because when you irritate the tick, they tend to release any germs that they have into you and you don't want to get those illnesses. So the best way is to get them off as quickly as possible and that's using a pair of tweezers. Okay, so you're going to take your tweezers, you're going to grasp that tick as close as you can to the skin, you're going to pull up slowly and steadily and then throw the tick away. Okay, and you don't need that tick. Some people think that you need to hang on to the tick so you know what kind of tick it was or something like that, but you really don't need that tick. The treatment for all the tick-borne illnesses here in North Carolina is the same. It doesn't matter which disease you get or which type of tick it was. So um, you want to throw that tick away and then you want to make sure that you wash your tweezers off, wash your hands real well, and wash the area where you were bit. Okay, and then, and then it's going to you know, you want to mark the day on the calendar that you were bit and what person it was because if you have a lot of people in your family and different people are getting bit, you want to say who it was. And then over the next 30 days, you're going to be watching for symptoms. And some of the symptoms you might be looking for are like um, flu-like symptoms, you know, like chills, fever, you might feel achy, headache. Some people get vomiting, diarrhea, that kind of thing, just not feeling well. And a lot of times we'll chalk it up to some other illness, but if you were bit in the last 30 days, you need to think, huh, I wonder if that had to do with that tick bite. You also might get achy joints, um, and some people get a rash. Now, not everybody will get a rash. Some people get a rash that's like a little uh, red dots all over the skin, and other people will get what we call a bullseye rash. And that'll start in that area where the tick came off, and then it'll extend out, and as it extends, the inside will turn kind of a lighter color, the outside will be darker, look like a bullseye. Okay, so if you get any of those things in the next 30 days, you wanna make sure you get to your doctor, tell them you had a tick bite, and he should treat you right away and not wait for tests to come back. Carla P. Drejita with Wake County Human Services, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. When we return, we'll share with you information about improved water safety guidelines for the county's recreational waterways. Stay tuned. This new mom is struggling to get the skates just right. Now she's holding on. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of siblings in foster care will take you just as you are. 
If you are one of the thousands of residents who take advantage of any of the county's nine recreational beaches, there are some new guidelines in place to make your visit a little safer. Wake County has adopted new regulations for recreational waters based on the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's revised water quality criteria and guidelines. The county's environmental services staff test the water in recreational beach areas as summer outdoor activity increases. In addition to the changes, new signs have been installed to communicate health risks to those who come in contact with the water. The new regulations use the more updated water quality criteria. It also affords new tools such as advisories instead of simple closures alone. Advisories like preemptive rain advisories to get ahead of any exposure. And the educational portion will really enhance the public knowledge and uh, awareness about swimming in fresh water. These regulations are important because they protect public health through monitoring and notification. The enhanced educational portion also will empower the public to make their own decision whether they want to swim and where. The, the colored signs that we've incorporated, the advisories, follow the universal red, yellow, green scheme. It's recommended by the World Health Organization, the CDC, and the EPA. And so when you go to a beach and there's a green sign, it means the beach is open and the recent water sampling meet county standards to also swim at your own risk. If a yellow sign is posted, that means a caution or advisory, and that means that the recent water sampling did not meet county standards. The beach is still open, but swim at your own risk. If you see a yellow sign also, it could mean that that was posted preemptively of a rain event. We know that water quality will deteriorate after a rain, so we can get ahead of any potential exposure. The red sign will obviously mean the beach is closed, and these are gonna be reserved for known public health nuisances and risks such as a sewer spill. So we sample for fecal indicator bacteria. They're highly associated with waterborne illnesses. These bacteria reside in the intestines of all warm-blooded mammals. So when we find the presence of them in water, that suggests the presence of a waste stream, whether that be mammal or human. The most important thing for the public to consider in staying healthy and safe and swimming in fresh water is to take simple precautions regardless of the water quality, regardless of what advisory is posted or not posted. And these are simple healthy swimming tips. Don't drink the water. Wash your hands before eating. Shower after swimming. Don't swim when you're sick. Check your diaper children frequently and to pay close attention to the advisories and the recent monitoring. We always recommend that people check our website at wakegov.com, Recreational Waters. We have an interactive map there where it shows real time any current advisories at all the swimming areas. We have frequently asked questions linked to public health organizations. And you can always email us at beaches at wakegov.com. Taught him how to hit a baseball. How to hit a receiver. The strike zone. The net. You taught him how to hit the upper corner. You even taught him how to hit the open man. But how much time have you spent teaching him what not to hit? Welcome back. The summer season is well underway. We don't have to tell you that includes some record-breaking hot temperatures. Residents are doing the best they can to stay cool, whether it's staying indoors or hitting the local pools. Jeffrey Hammerstein, District Chief for the Wake County Emergency Medical Services, is here to talk about safety and keeping cool during this summer season. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, during the course of the these summer months, what types of incidences uh, does EMS have a greater uh, response to? Well, Eric, we know when the temperature goes up and we have these runs of heat waves, it's very predictable that we're going to have an increase in calls to people for heat-related emergencies. Um, we'll see the people who are out working uh, long hours, the people who are out exercising in the heat, uh, that frankly didn't take the proper steps to prevent a heat emergency uh, and, and finally succumb to it. 
It's difficult for us to capture all of the re reaction patient-wise to heat emergencies because some of it is not just the people who have heat exhaustion or heat cramps. There are other things like chronic illnesses that are made worse by the heat and, and hot, humid conditions. And, and so we will see some people who just suffer as a result of that. Now, how does a person know that they're uh, getting into trouble or into some type of heat emergency? Eric, our bodies talk to us all the time and, and give us the warning signs that we need if we listen. If you're out and about, whether it's working, exercise, or just in a recreational state, uh, if you start to experience things like heat cramps, um, things like feeling dizzy, disoriented, confused, uh, just really tired, your body's telling you you're getting too hot, too dehydrated, and it's time to take action. Uh, the steps that we have to do when we feel those things are to get out, first of all, of, of whatever the, the activity is and into a cooler place, get cooled off, rest, and drink lots of fluids and, and replenish the body with fluids. What if you have no means to get cool? And, and that's, that's a problem that we definitely see. For the, the populations that we respond to who are out doing things, they probably have the means to, to stay cool, to get prehydrated in the first place, drinking water before they go out and do. Uh, but we also realize we have residents that don't have the means to stay cool. There are programs offered by Wake County that can help people get a fan to the house. Uh, if there are people that don't have homes or, or adequate shelter to go to to cool down, there are places in Wake County where they can actually go during the course of the hottest hour of the, hours of the day and, and seek some, uh, some relief from that heat. Another emergency that always comes up this time of year, drownings. Is it a concern for you and your staff and does EMS see an increase in drownings during this time of year? Uh, absolutely, and it's, it's uh, a very unfortunate thing. Again, we have to look at prevention. Uh, the, the tragedies happen, they're heartbreaking for everyone involved. Um, but we have to talk ahead of time about how to keep those things for ha from happening. The most important thing is supervision, uh, paying attention to what's going on at the pool. Uh, if, if you have children, if you're babysitting kids and you're taking them to the pool, it's absolutely vital that even if you feel comfortable with them being in the pool, even if you feel comfortable with their skills, it's vital that you watch over them and make sure they're not getting into trouble. Um, if, if we're relaxing on the side of the pool with a magazine and a, and a cell phone and sunglasses and, and earbuds in and go into our own little world, we're not supervising those children and, and that's when they're at greatest risk. It's important also to understand what drowning actually looks like. A lot of times on television programs we see things where there's a big dramatic flaying of the arms and yelling and screaming and splashing that attracts a lot of attention. In reality, an actual drowning can be very quiet and unnoticeable unless you're truly paying attention and looking for that. I would recommend Googling videos just what does drowning look like so that you can start to see some of those images and, and better understand what you're looking for. Well, hopefully some of the tips that you shared uh, in this segment will help uh, keep a very safe and enjoyable summer for all our viewers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jeffrey Hammerstein, District Chief for Wake County EMS. Coming up, we'll update you on the reopening of one of Wake County's most popular library branches. Stay tuned. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. This is a serious problem, but one we can solve. Visit feedingamerica.org to help. Together we can solve hunger. Together we're feeding America. Welcome back. In February of this year, firefighters and law enforcement were called to the Leesville Community Library due to a fire that was allegedly intentionally set. 
the extensive damage forced county staff to close the facility to begin renovations. After months of renovations, the library is close to reopening. Joining us to talk about that wonderful news is Ann Burlingame, Assistant Director with Wake County Libraries. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. I guess the first question, um, obviously we, we know about the background of the situation. Um, how much damage was uh, done to the library? Well, the majority of the damage was the fire and the water. There was fire in the book drop room and then the water to put out the fire um, was damaged a lot of the library because the fire department had to come through the roof with the fire hose to put out the fire. Uh, what parts of the library suffered the most damage? Well, primarily it was, as I said, the book drop room where the firecrackers came into the book drop and started the fire. The circulation room where we check in all the books and I'll do all our background work. And then the bathrooms were also very damaged. Um, what is being done to get the library back online? Well, right now we're working with a restoration company, and what that company is doing is they're coming and taking all the contents out of the library, so all the furnishings, all the shelving, as well as all the books, and that's 46,000 books. And then what they'll do is they treat everything because there was extensive smoke damage, and so all the 46,000 books, each book will have an ozone treatment and that will get the book so it doesn't have any residual smoke damage and or odor and then they will bring them back to us when that's done. When will the uh, library reopen to the public? Well the library restoration company will be done in mid-August and that means they're going to bring everything back that's treated, there won't be any odor of smoke and the library staff will come in soon after that and we will begin unpacking and shelving 46,000 books. And we hope to be open to the public uh, the first week of September. And, and one thing I'm curious about, um, obviously it's almost like redoing this whole library. Will it look different uh, to patrons than it was before the fire? You know, it's going to look a little different. And really what we did is we just enlarged the area um, accessible to children because there's so many children's programs going on. There's so many children in the area. So before it was the library, probably a quarter of it was for children. So we've just expanded that a bit. Okay, and how can the community keep up with the progress of, of this uh, library branch? Well, we are keeping that information updated on our website, um, wakegov.com slash libraries. So we have weekly updates about what's going on with the restoration, and we also will soon have updates about our grand reopening celebration. Well, it sounds like uh, there is a rainbow at the end of that uh, dark cloud. So thank you so much for updating us about Leesville Community Library. Thank you so much. And Burlingame, Assistant Director with Wake County Libraries. That's our show for today. Keep up with the latest Wake County news by visiting us online at wakeup.com slash news or on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Thanks for watching.